from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's edition of the Wow Report where we count down the top 10 things of the week that made us go wow. wow. The lovely James St. James is away, sadly. Um, but standing in for him is the wonderful Blake. Hi, Hi. Blake. Our producer. And of course, I'm joined by our chief creative officer, <laughs> Tom Campbell. And I am Fenton Bailey. So there you go. Um, together again. <laughs> trying to make it different every time. Um, <laughs> should we just start with the countdown? Yes. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Number 10, Tom. Number 10. I have a somewhat rhetorical question. But has Saturday Night Live become the gayest show on television? This from the producers of RuPaul's Drag Race. I think they might be out gaying us. Did you guys happen to catch this week's Saturday Night Live? No. I'll be honest. I haven't seen an episode from this season. I want to see. I love Aubrey Plaza, too. I just haven't watched it yet. I've right. been well, looking at this be, for a while. Let this be. Yeah, let this be your big post-it reminder because, by the way, there's two ways to consume Saturday Night Live. You can watch it at night with commercials, and which kind of makes it never funny, or you can watch it in bed in the UK when you're feeling lonely and estranged and you laugh your padded ass off. Aubrey Plaza was the host, and I just read today highest ratings of the season. So that's positive, right? That's like a good, because I don't, I always am rooting for Saturday Night Live because it's an institution and because it's always refreshing itself. This has been a rebuilding season. A lot of the, you know, a lot of people stuck through COVID and we're good, but it's a lot of new people. It always takes a little time rewriting and finding things. Um, but there was just one hilarious mother tucking sketch after another. Aubrey Plaza so many good things happen because of White Lotus. And what is it? Aubrey Plaza is a big, 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 big star now. She's always been a star, but she's a big star. I can't wait to see what she does next. The way she, she's one of those rare, she's like Jennifer Coolidge in a different way, but like the characters they play and the person they are seem to live in the same universe. So you're kind of getting, it's not reality. She's a great actress, but she's giving, she just is a type and she's such a modern type. And speaking of the gift that keeps on giving White Lotus, they did a parody called Black Lotus. And I'm only angry because I'd kind of been planning that for Drag Race, Black Lotus, why I gotta be black. And it was just like, what if the White Lotus <laughs> resort was run by black people? And they were all just like, at one point there's like, there's dead people in the ocean. They come running to e e uh, Ego and uh, the cast member. And she's like, she goes, is, and since when did the ocean become the hotel? This is the hotel, okay? I'm in charge of the hotel, not the ocean. It was just dry, fabulous humor throughout. They also did, and you know, one of the big reasons uh, I think is that Bowen Yang has also um, emerged as a major player. Like, you know, I go back to the old, old references of Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd, but Bowen is becoming one of those star players, the Will Ferrells of the thing. And they did um, a, a sketch about Megan. Have you guys seen the movie Megan, which I have not? I have. Yes, you have. And it's, you know, about the doll that like, you know, and so they, they're like, you know, Megan did great. But, you know, now the, in a, the, the number one demographic, it's a hit with everyone. The number one demographic is gay people. So they're slapping together a quick seagull and they put her in like gay situations and people dancing with her and her destroying people. <laughs> and there was even, this reminded me of a Christine Wig thing, but they did the Miss Universe pageant, which I didn't see, but I know it was a lot of reason. <laughs> right. And, and every time they came, they just were all yelling, hello, I'm so-and-so from this country. And again, you have to see them. I'm, it's, I feel like, you know what this is? This is every Monday in my junior high when Saturday Night Live first started, we would have lunch and retell the, the sketches. <laughs> so I realize I'm having a total regressive moment here. But we would be drinking, our, like milk would come out our noses because we'd be laughing. <laughs> um, um, the Megan so, thing, the weekend update's always funny. Anyway. I Some love things it. like that. Miss Universe thing. I would have thought is almost impossible to parody since it felt like a parody itself as she staggered on stage with the moon on her back. I was like, this cannot be real, right? It is so, it's like, what you know, they say, wear the dress, don't let it wear you. What was that? That was like a whole uh, junkyard. Right. Well, um, anyway, I just, I for anyone, I, again, I'm always rooting for Saturday Night Live. Um, I love watching it online. Uh, it's easy to see internationally. And uh, if you haven't seen the Aubrey Plaza episode, which just aired last weekend, 
I highly recommend it. She uh, is hilarious. Have you guys ever seen those uh, clips of her on YouTube where she's at, on, on, at a talk show like Conan O'Brien or whatever? It's just so awkward and hilarious. I'll post just, that with yeah, Conan. post some because I only know her really from from White Lotus. And but I love your point, Tom, that um, the characters in White Lotus are characters extracted from the tropes of reality TV. I think that it's such they yes, the actors and everything, but they're real, they're reality characters that you haven't really seen in <laughs> unscripted, in scripted fiction before. I yeah. it, that's, that's exactly it. That's like amazing. I mean, Jennifer Coolidge could only come from reality television in some way, yes. right? Yes, yeah. and she's getting her roses now too, which is so right. delightful. Yeah, oh, everybody is. All right, okay, number nine, Blake. Number nine. I just wanted to talk about the Oscar nominations. Have, do you guys have any feelings about anything Oscar? Well, I'm actually tentatively excited because there was a lot of positive buzz about the reveal when they the, the show that they do when they reveal uh -huh. um, what's nominated, uh, I didn't see it, but I just read a whole bunch of reviews <laughs> saying how great it was and how this augurs really well for the Oscars itself potentially. And they got that fabulous new um, I was going to say Prime Minister, um, head of the Academy, Janet <laughs> Janet Yang, I think she's stunning and gorgeous and just seems really on it. I wish I was more positive. I didn't see the announcement. I'm over here. I mean, they Top Guns in there, which is a big name movie. Um, you know, Avatar, which I will never watch. Can't make me. Two is in there, but the rest of them tend to be super obscure movies. It's it's more. You know, it's not the necessarily the Academy's fault. It's just that weird state of consumption that we talk about every week in some some way, which is, you know. You think like when, because I, I watch, I, I get stuck in YouTube uh, tunnels when I can't sleep, you know, and I was kept watching like Cher's acceptance speech at the Oscars. And the year that Cher won for Moonstruck, um, Glenn Close was nominated for Fatal Attraction, Holly Hunter for Broadcast News. You know, it was like this star studded, like all of them are kind of iconic movies or four out of the five. 88, I think. Yeah, yeah. But you just think now it's like we, we you kind of learn about people. It's like the independent film awards. It's like you get to learn about people you've never heard of before. And it's just but I also think when that was happening, TV had like murder. She wrote, you know, there wasn't good TV. And now we have White Lotus and all that kind of stuff. But we'll we'll see. I'll probably watch as much as I bitch. But it's um, it is it's a tough time. To be a movie yeah. star, it's a tough I'm, time to be a movie star. <laughs> I'm one of those people that watches it, like you said a couple of weeks ago, after the show and clips online. I'd rather just see the highlights. Yes, um, but and I never thought I would say this, but it's the same with the MTV VMAs. Like the Oscars are just like that in that I don't know anyone that's nominated anymore. I thought it, I was just getting old or something, but also there's like 18 best picture nominations. So I think though it's 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 you're right. I think the award itself is almost now in the background, and it's what's in the foreground is the red carpet and the yeah. sort of the show, the reality show of the awards is the show, and yeah, who really cares about the prize? You know, right. it's, it's sort of a weird thing. Although um, everything, everywhere, all at once. Exactly. Most nominations, I can't remember if it's 11, 11. or 12. I think it's 11. It, yeah. So that's pretty That's cool. cool. And I'm kind of, I follow Jamie Lee Curtis on, you know, socials and it's fun watching her. This is her first, you know, yes. nomination. She's, oh my gosh. She did this amazing thing um, at an award show recently where, of course she won or uh, who won it? Who won? Um, it wasn't Jamie Lee Curtis, was it, who won? Michelle Yeoh? Yes. And and um, she was so excited for the event that she brought these little marbles and gave them to her crew and cast just so that if they didn't win, they wouldn't go home empty-handed. And she gave them a beautiful marble with the world on it. And Hold like, on. Well, really Hold cool. on. Why, why do you have one? Because I went straight on Amazon and bought some. Because I was like, uh, I'm going to start giving people marbles 
so they don't go home empty-handed. So and it's a world of wonder. I love it's it. It's a world of wonder. Like this is like this is next year's Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Fit I gotta tell you, Marvel. she's amazing. But that a great idea, even better. Completely inexpensive. You get like five marbles for like three dollars. So Fenton lost I, his marbles. I would take a handful of those marbles because I'm a competitive bitch, and I would throw them on the stage oh, as the as the other people are winning, and they'd fall down showgirl style. Thank you very much. That would be amazing because you know you can't always depend on Will Smith to come and slap people, right? So, <laughs> yeah. What are they going to do to up that? Because isn't there some new MMA thing about slapping? <laughs> isn't there some new like? Have you read about this? That there's uh -oh. some new like martial arts show and 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 they can slap each other or something. So like maybe that's uh with sausage fingers. <laughs> there you go. There you well, go. I, I think um James would agree with me. I think I kind of want Triangle of Sadness to win Best Picture, or maybe Elvis. Yeah, couldn't get through Elvis. either of them. Really. I am. I, I saw it. I, I just don't think you should call it a movie. You should call it like an amusement ride. Because that's, <laughs> that's what Baz Luhrmann shows. Baz they don't Larkin. really give you this, the feeling of a movie. They give you me of the sort of oversaturated, crazy, you know, sweet, you know, cotton candy that then suddenly makes you feel sick to your stomach. And then you just keep doing more and going upside down. And all Sounds like stuff. drugs. This is your brain on drugs. <laughs> well, right. you know. I didn't love Moulin Rouge, but Romeo and Juliet holds a very special place in my heart. Mm. Oh. Just saying. All right. Well, when are the Oscars, Blake? When are they? They are Sunday, March 12th, 2023. All right. All right. I'll start mm -hmm. accepting um uh, offer some designers for my gown now if you're if you're Look, listening. I heard no one would dress you. I know, because I'm so thick in the middle. <laughs> well, I know exactly who would dress you, and it's number eight. Number eight. Scaparelli. Scaparelli is a fashion, you know, what's so fa fascinating to me about fashion is the way fashion brands get reinvented. They've been around forever. And then they have these moments of hotness and they're suddenly cool again. Mm -hmm. um, and of the brands that haven't really been reinvented yet, I suppose, Scaparelli is one of them. 20, in 1927 launch, uh, she was big rivals with Coco Chanel. And Coco Chanel, of course, was very elegant and minimalist. And Scaparelli was kind of crazy and lobster hats and lobster. I mean, very James St. James. And I'm just so sorry he isn't here this week. <laughs> but this week they had their show. It's it's um, spring couture week or something in Paris. And they had their show. And Scandal um, down the runway came three models in um, dresses that had huge heads on them. Um, the Animal uh, heads. Animal heads, thank you, exactly, yes. The uh, the white leopard uh, that was worn by, let me see, Shalom Harlow, or the white leopard. Um, there was a lion, and there was also, oh, Naomi Campbell wore a she-wolf. And these are, I actually thought they were unbelievably stunning. They're like, like fake fur, of course, everything's totally fake, but the heads are so realistically and brilliantly realized, it does look like someone just ripped a, hunting trophy off the wall and slapped it on the dress <laughs> and it, and of course therein lies the problem you know the internet was outraged people were like this is trophy hunting this is encouraging big glorifying big game hunting um and the fact that they were fake seemed to be completely lost on I all the outraged i saw you all, i mean kylie kendall kylie jenner was also wearing it at the yeah. show and uh Peta, praised her because it was fake. That's right. They said that uh, um, where there's a will, there's a way, because they're very anti-fur. And they said that they celebrate the beauty of wild animals and maybe a statement against trophy hunting. So now the woke people can't even agree where they stand. <laughs> like some are very for it, some are very against it. I just have a few questions. How do you wear a jacket over that? Okay. Like, you know, if it's cold out, um, there was great memes. It created great memes, including James St. James, just like the club kids have been doing this forever. Don't, you know, do not step in my territory, which I loved. Mm -hmm. And then there was a picture of from like the Lion King where they're holding up the baby cub, but they're holding up Kylie Jenner or whichever Jenner it was <laughs> with her big head. Um, it, it's, you know, 
is it fashion? Sure. Or is it Instagram paradery? Or is that all the same thing now? I, I'm not, I'm not judging it. It's just like, it did make a stir. I know about it. I would say that's more fashion than, did you see those Victor and Rolf uh, dresses yes. that came out? I, I mean, my God, like a mannequin basically just worn, uh, this is uh, horizontal, isn't it? Yes, worn horizontally, or the mannequin that's like walking alongside. I mean, unwearable. The dresses were literally, it was upside down dress. There right. was the sideways dress. Uh -huh. And then there was kind of the looking at the dress in the top like it was a big hole. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, the, also, did you see Doja Cat and 30,000 or however many? Yes, 30,000 30, ski crystals that took five hours to apply. On her skull, on her face, on her neck, on her gown. It was Some, Another meme, because the internet's funnier than I am, was, um, and I, I promised myself I was just going to pop one pimple. <laughs> well, and there, everyone's saying it caused like a major outbreak of trypophobia. You know, that hat. thing where people are um, afraid of, like, honeycombs and uh, holes. <laughs> yeah. What sort, of, what sort of holes are we talking about? Like, um, I, I don't really know how to explain it, but, like, a lot of people were triggered by a campaign of American Horror Story a few years ago when it was, like, honeycombs and... Oh, like the pinhead type. Thing. I guess I, I don't really understand it, but yeah, a lot of people were like, ah, oh, trypophobia. Uh oh, I mean, it was a compelling look and it was slightly on the sinister side, I thought, slightly yeah. hellish, right? Apparently, the inspiration for that show, um, Daniel Roseberry is the designer, was um, Dante's Inferno. Ah, oh, that's Which a fun one. My roommate Ooh. Stephen is working on a new series in his cross stitch about Dante's Inferno. Oh, has he still got that maple folk crotch? He does. He's saving it for the show, I think. But I see. <laughs> because no Blake's pressure. roommate, we should have him on. He does these amazing needlepoint. It is needlepoint, right? It's cross stitch, I believe. Oh, right. Yeah. I have a phobia for that. It freaks me out. I can't <laughs> see cross stitch. <laughs> it's true. All right, let's take a quick break. RuPaul's Drag Race Season 15 and Untucked. Fridays exclusively on WOW Presents Plus. That's worldwide, excluding the USA, Canada, Australia. And here in the US, it's on MTV. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Great season. Blake, you got a question? I do. I saw this um, on like TikTok or something. Two cities in the US share the same name. They are also the largest cities by population in their respective states, but neither is a state capital. What's the name of the cities? I got it right off. I don't know how. Maybe I'm just. Wow. Um, we'll be right, <laughs> right back after the break. You listen to radio. Wow. you. <laughs> this question, Blake, has completely <laughs> devastated my ability <laughs> to even form sentences and speak. Um, you're listening to the Wow Report on Radio Andy. And we'll be back right after the break with the answer. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. All right, welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with Tom and Blake sitting in for James, who's sadly away this week. Um, I think what was that crazy question? Okay, so two cities in the United States of America share the same name. They're the largest cities by population in their respective states but neither one of them is a state capital. What's the name of the cities? Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, Kansas. Good guess. I, no. I can't even think of two cities with the same name, like of any size. Give me a clue. Like, um, Albany. I don't know. I'll get, it's, you're close to it. They're really? way up north. But on both sides of the, the, the United Salem. States. Salem. Portland. There's Portland, Maine, and Portland, Oregon. And uh, mm. the capital of Oregon is, what is the capital of Oregon? Eugenia, I think. And the capital of Maine is? Is Augusta. 
There you go. Oh my god. I'm I did so really impressed. well in grammar school, you guys. I was so much smarter than both of you when I was in grammar school. I have <laughs> lost everything, but in grammar school, I was it. You honey, you started smart, you've stayed smart, and you show us <laughs> up every week. <laughs> you are smarter than a fifth grader. <laughs> Just by one grade. Or a 60-year-old or <laughs> anyone else. Um, so we're counting down the top 10 things that made us go wow. And we've reached number seven in our countdown. Number seven. As I've said before, I'm in the UK. I'm working very hard, Fenton. You don't have to worry. Every, whatever it costs for me to be here, I am working, working. I'm working now. I'll be working when I hang up. But I did take this little tiny window of time on the weekend. Just a little tiny time. <laughs> and Theron and I went to the West End, which is such a pleasure. It, uh, theater going in New York is great, but there's some kind of passion for it in, West, in the West End that this feels like everybody's into it. And we went and saw uh, a new play called Best of Enemies. Um, and it's written by James Graham, who was a British playwright, who's done a lot of political uh, dramas. And Best of Enemies, I knew very little about it going in, which is my way. It stars um, David Harward as William F. Buckley and Zachary Quinto as Gore Vidal, and it's um, it's based on a documentary of the same name from a few years ago about the historic 1968 presidential conventions where ABC News, who was way low, you know, CBS was huge, NBC was very big, and ABC was nowhere. It was Howard K. Smith was the anchor. And traditionally, news had been very, very neutral. And they would just do gavel to gavel coverage of the conventions and not insert and just sort of be the eye. And ABC was like, what if we get opinion leaders, William F. Buckley from the left, and they got him to say yes. And he, they were both very similar. And he was like, the one person I won't work with is uh, Gore Vidal. And so they hired Gore Vidal because they're not stupid. And, um, and, and uh, as a result, um, they did hire Gore Vidal and they did a stint of our, uh, of coverage. They would do these debates and they're available on YouTube too. And they're really fascinating. And the premise in a nutshell, the premise of the documentary and the, and the play is that um, sort of our, he said, she said, left, right opinion over fact news phenomenon, which is all it is now all the mm -hmm. theater started at that very moment. Um, and reality really show conflict, right? Reality show conflict of just yes. you put two people in a room who can't stand each other and let them have at it. Exactly. And they were, are you familiar with those debates at all? Fenton? Yes. Well, not when crime? they happened, but I saw the documentary, um, at Sundance and I thought it was just incredible, just amazing. But the interesting thing is while I remember them going at it and fighting, I can't remember what the sort of ultimate takeaway was like i can't remember not so much who won but just sort of what the emotional because i think there was something quite moving about it but i can't i just can't well, there's a couple of things mm. one is which I, you know 1968 is such a studied year and yet you can't get it we can't get enough of it and i was aware of this because of that but you know the democratic convention in chicago was the one of the most violent police state events First of all, it was held in Chicago. Uh, Mayor Daley, who was like a total strong arm, he was a Democrat, but he was total like law and order guy. The convention center was set in the middle of the meat district, so they were they were being inundated by flies everywhere they went, and <laughs> and and it was violent, and there was tear gas on the streets, and people, were, you know, reporters were being gassed. Um, Paul Newman was a delegate, as was uh, uh, Arthur Miller, and they, you know, everyone was attacked, and so. It just becomes this dark, 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 dark journey. And, and they sort of touch upon the fact that they they want to do it to sort of just blow their own horns, right? Gore Vidal and William F. Buckley, very different points of view, but the same kind of person, self-promoting, you know, very articulate, very intellectual, which is different from today. Um, mm -hmm. But they both were then stuck with this convention and this horrible feeling of like, you know, at one point they have a quote from Paul Newman to saying, you know, it, it's 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 like we're in a war camp. You know, we're in a war and they're keeping them outside as we decide this decision. And the other thing that the play hinges starts and then cliffhangs and goes back to is at the, uh, in the next to last one, Gore Vidal gets under William F. Buckley's skin because William F. Buckley was doing better. on In the Republican one, he was kind of overwhelmed by Gore Vidal because Gore Vidal was just being gay and saying crazy things. And in the second one, the Republican, William F. Buckley kind of 
was a little media trained and knew what to do. But at one point, William F. Buckley loses it after Gorvidal calls him a neo-fascist. And he said, he called him a queer and shut up before I give you a reason. You know, so it was like this explosive anger. So in the moment, William F. Buckley lost because he lost his cool. Right. He could never supposedly get over it. He talked about it every day. But supposedly people who were friends with Gore Vidal said he also talked about it every day. And, it, you know, it became sort of Grey Gardens with Gore Vidal. But at the time it was it, it, what's funny about it is it is the he said, she said the left, right. But they were such intellectuals and their, their manner of speaking is so entertaining. It's worth watching the documentary if you can't see the play or even watching the debates themselves. Well, I think also what you said, Tom, is just how cerebral or intellectual it was then i mean you couldn't get that level of intelligence on the vocabulary alone yes today. It's incredible i mean people speaking in entire paragraphs and it was and referencing like the classics you know yes. just like <laughs> i mean it was it was amazing although it's funny isn't it that the takeaway is when he called him a what it was a, a crypto a neo fascist crypto Nazi or was it a neo Nazi crypto fascist? I right, and then that moment was the is the one that lives on. Yes, the ultimate answer. By the way, Morgan Neville did one of your uh, documentary you love, uh, Twenty Feet from Stardom. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, and good. Thank you. Be my neighbor as thoughts. well. The Mister Rogers documentary. Would you? Be uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right, let's go on to number six. Number six. Like, um, well, we did the Oscar nomination, so we must do the Razzies now. <laughs> it's kind of interesting that uh, both the Oscars nominate nominated Blonde from Netflix. They nominated Anna de Armas for Best Act Actress in a Leading Role. But sh the film is also nominated for Best Film or Worst Film at the Razzies. Up against Disney's Pinocchio, Good Morning, M O U R N I N G, uh, The King's Daughter, and Morbius. And I've only heard of three of these, I believe. Do you now, what's become of the country when we don't even know the names of the Razzie movies? <laughs> what's going on? I can't yeah, yeah, people. There now, know. there has been a little bit of a you know controversy because. They also nominated Ryan Kiera Armstrong from Firestarter, um, which was on one of the streamers. I think it was Peacock or something uh, as worst actress. And she's only 12 years old. She's since been taken off of the nominees list. But what do you guys think? You got, I think, you know, there's some meme out there that says woke is for people who can't, you know, pronounce the words like, uh, you know, sensitive and, and thoughtful, but I mean, nominating a kid on a is is not the smartest thing to do. And they took it off, so hopefully it'll be okay. But yeah, a twelve year old. But contrarily, I mean, the Razzies is, is just a joke. It's not like I mean that it's a sort of. I suppose it's the fa the sense of humor failure that is so evident. Whether it's Scaparelli and the heads and people just not getting that it's a joke and that it's like it's like oh dear. But I suppose yes, you're right. It, I, I thought about my 12-year-old self and if I was nominated for a Razzie. Well, first I thought I'd be glad, actually, to get any kind right. of recognition. But um... You would have you'd have used your allowance to buy a publicist. I know you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I would, if I was, I'd take it and run with it, you know? I would tell you, everything we do and say today, you guys know this, but even in producing the shows we produce, it's like I just think twice about everything. Yeah, because, you know, especially, we, you know, one of our shows, we do a lot of jokes and a lot of double entendres and a lot of, you know, stupidly, purposely stupid things and inappropriate things to be funny. But you're just like, oh, is this going to come out OK? Is something going to happen on the world, you know, newscape that happens the same that coincides the same week as right. <laughs> when we use the word, you know, Razzie? Um, anyway, it's not. She's in great company too. Diane Keaton, Alicia Silverstone, Bryce Dallas Howard. I mean, that's amazing. I'm like, sad that Alicia. That I'm sad about Alicia being nominated. She's my favorite. No, she's still your favorite. She's still amazing. Yeah, you're and right. Like, it don't take them too seriously. To win yeah. an Oscar and a Razzie, that's like that's like an ego type amazing achievement. I, I feel like, and my facts might be wrong, but I feel like Halle Berry was nominated for an Academy Award and a Razzie the same year. I and, think and it went was to both ceremonies. 
it was maybe she did too, but also uh, Sandra Bullock. I think Sandra Bullock won. Yes. The yes, Oscar yes. Oh, wow. That's so great. Well, and the other good news is that Sylvester Stallone is nominated and he seems to be, unless I'm mistaken, nominated every year. I mean, he must <laughs> have been, which is good. I wish, do the Razzies give Lifetime Achievement Awards? That would be fun. I bet they do. It's coming up on uh, March 11th. It's not televised, is it, the Razzies? No, I don't think they ever are, unfortunately. Wow, Presents Plus, here I, they come. That's I would watch that. I would watch that. I would too. Let's let's get on that. Yeah. All right. Okay. So that's the Razzies coming up. Um, number five. Number five. I want to talk to you today about the exciting potential of artificial intelligence and using a model called Chat GPT. Now, AI, it, it's a kind of computer technology that can perform tasks normally require that normally require human intelligence. So chat GPT is a specific AI that can generate text. So write stories, answer questions, and, and it can even have conversations with people like the one I'm having with you now, because all of that was written by chat GPT. Isn't that wow. yeah. I just typed in, could you explain what chat GPT is? And out came the answer. Uh, we'll so put you the were reading in. that. I was reading that. Perform. I was performing it, of course, giving it. Mm. But, oh my God, Oscar um, Razi. It was not written by moi. It was written by the the. So then I thought, well, you know, there's been a lot of um, controversy about this. So I asked, I asked Chat GPT, what what is the controversy about? And it came back with a whole list. <laughs> it says job loss. Some people are concerned that AI is going to be take away jobs previously done by humans. Lack of accountability. AI can make decisions, take actions with real world consequences, but no real accountability. Bias and discrimination, because AI is amplifying biases that uh, in the day that uh, they're trained on. Privacy, because um, they, they store and process large amounts of personal data. Singularity. Some people worry that advanced AI could become so powerful it prevents a, proposes a, a threat to humanity. Anyway, ethical issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That also, all of that was written by the Chat GPT. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So do we need? We're going to be. I was going to say Blake's going to be replaced, but Blake will probably stay in charge and then just like type in the topics and, and, and let them speak for themselves. Yeah. Editing will be really easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, I've, yeah. I've heard that there have been like crackdowns on college papers that are written. Like back in my day, it used to be like, Oh, you can't just pull a, a paper that's sold off the internet because there was software that could detect, you know, that a whole paper was written. But now with this chat GPT, you can re write, you know, uh, unique papers, yeah, different yeah. unique papers. And there's now a software that will detect that you use chat GPT. Oh, really? Is it? I didn't I've know heard that. that. Oh, okay. That's interesting. You know, you've heard I... the argument that, mm -hmm. you know, who needs math when you, we have, our phone will do it. And now it's going to be like, who needs to read or know about anything? The phone will do it. You know? Well, Tom, I was thinking, you know, like one of the sort of things we do at World of Wonder a lot is we have to write decks for to accompany our ideas and pitches. And <laughs> I've, I, you know, it's sitting on my to-do list. I got to write this deck about this idea. So I just put it in the chat GPT and I said, write me a, write me a treatment on this subject. And um, <laughs> I've, I became, and here's the thing, look, I mean, you know, decks are a pain to write, and we all know that executives never read them. They just like, oh, yeah, you know, so I'm kind of like. Well, like a cover not? letter. Right? So what did you type in? Jersey Shore meets RuPaul's Drag Race. What, 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 did you, what did you write? I typed in, tell me the story of George Santos. <laughs> <laughs> So, what a story it is. Oh, honey, the lies, they just they just keep coming. I think actually oh even George Santos is ahead of the chat GPT yes. in terms of new scandals <laughs> and um, <laughs> new revelations. Controversy. Right. 
Let's take a quick break. Um, brand new show on Wild Presents Plus, Carrie Kerr's. Carrie Kerr, am I just saying it wrong? Is this the oh, KK right. thing? It's Carrie, Carrie cares. cares. She cares. Carrie cares. Why can't I say that? I don't know. Chat GPT would be able to say that, right? <laughs> um, all eight episodes available to binge now on wowpresentsplus.com. Um, she is one of the standouts from RuPaul's Drag Race season 14, of course. And she says, shares the secrets to living her best life. Mm -hmm. Yes, she's our new Oprah. There you go. <laughs> you got a question, Blake? I do, I do. Um, I just talked about the Razzie nominees. What actor was nominated for a Razzie in the Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor categories, as well as the Worst On-Screen Couple category with his latex-laden face and ludicrous accent? This year? This year. Okay. Oh. All right. We'll have the answer right after the break. You're listening to The Wow Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to The Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with Tom and Blake. We're counting down the top 10 things of the week that made us go wow. And Blake, you got a tantalizing question. Yes, it's about this year's Razzie nominees. This actor was nominated for Worst Actor and Worst Supporting Actor in two different films, as well as Worst On-Screen Couple. Uh, he was nominated with his latex-laden face and ludicrous accent. Who was it? I fear it is the one, the only, the American treasure, Tom Hanks. That's correct. It's talking about his his uh, role in Pinocchio and his oh. role in Elvis. Oh. I thought Tom Hanks could do no wrong. Me too. That's why I thought it was surprising. Well, his new movie, The Life of Otto or something, is supposed to be good. So, I have heard that. All righty. We're counting down the top 10 things that made us go, wow, we've reached number four. Number four. Again, working, working, working here, Fenton. Not a moment to relax. <laughs> uh, but in the wee hours of the morning when I wake up and out of my own personal sleep time, um, Channel 5 here has a new documentary about Stock, Aitken, and Watermill. No, I'm coming over right away. Oh, my gosh. And there was one called The Hit Factory, I guess, 10 or 20 years ago. But they're still around. And... Blake, do you, does that ring a bell to you? I was going to have to ask you to spell it. <laughs> um, I will, I'll, I'll text it to you. But they are the British producers. Two of them were the creative guys. One of them was the business guy. And they created, they were like, at a pub, they shook hands. And they were these maverick record producers who had a, a place, uh, like a, in a bad neighborhood. And they had some early hits with some artists we don't know in America so much. But their first big, 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 big hit was Dead, Al Dead or Alive, You Spin Me Right Round. Uh -huh. And they went on to do Kylie Minogue, Ooh. I Should Be So Lucky, and uh, 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 Never Gonna Give You Up, Never Gonna Get You Down. Wow. And I'm just skimming the surface because they were known to have, and you think about back then, and I think I was one of these people, infectious songs that, that live forever, by the way. And they're as fresh today as they were then, but they were kind of considered lowbrow. Yes. Um, People were and, terrible and, snobs about them. Yeah. Yes. And pop and and they were not considered well. And they even at one point, it's a two-part documentary. I've only seen the first half, to be fair. And they got everyone, Kylie speaks, every, they got everyone to come do it. Cause it is again one of these things with the perspective of time and the way the music lasts. It is they're a jewel box. They are, you know, like Motown. They created such amazing things. And they did it in a way that was so modern because it was the, kind of the beginning of the digital age. And they talk about these artists that would show up and they'd be like, they'd be there for an hour. They, they, they were famous for meeting the artists like at the door. They were so backed up and be like, hey, how you doing? Hey, come on in. Yeah, we got something for you here. They'd have some tracks and they and then the peer, person would work with them for a while. Like, OK, thank you. And they're like, we didn't sing the song. It's like, oh, no, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of how it works today largely you know there's that kind of production where it's all bits and pieces and um anyway it, it's an amazing they, were, they, amazing, uh, they, they, they do have a, a signature sound and it is very much synth loops and drum machines 
there were pre-sampling. They weren't really into sampling. It was this sort of lovely, bright electronic sound, generally upbeat, I would say. Yep. yep. Um, and so just just rompy, like not quite not quite as um, speedy as high energy, but a very electro, very dance pop, very like 120 beats per minute kind of yep. thing. Um, they were amazing. And they it was a signature sound. It really, really was. Not that everyone and, sounded and, the same, but it was like a packet of Starburst. They're different flavors, but you know it's a Starburst. Yes. And they did um, a, an early hit before uh, Dead or Alive was they did a, 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 a song with Divine the drag queen yes. called you, you think, think you're a man and it ended up being like a top 10 hit and they just the stories this is just one story but they they, they brought in divine and they were like what's going to come you know, they knew his reputation eating poo on camera and of course in comes out of drag this middle-aged nice uncle type and so and they didn't have much time and they recorded him and they talk about getting his vocals like he couldn't sing but we got, we got a really good performance out of him and they played it for the manager she's like that's awful. He Divine screams. He doesn't sing. So they called him. He goes, no cell phones then. So they paged him at the airport, brought him back in a cab. He yelled it twice. They went back and they had a, like a top 10 hit with it. So it's just how funny. And 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 there actually is a, and you, you learn, and I'm, I'm uh, jumping all over myself here, but they also did R&B sounding tracks. To your point, the Starbucks, they had a lot of flavors. They, you know, they, they had a signature sound, but they were able to produce some really interesting things. Um, and uh, Hazel Dean, and and I never heard Fenton, you probably knew, but the history of is it Mel and Kim, the sisters? Oh, yes, right, yeah, who had a huge hit, and they were they were met and they were beautiful black women, and they had a big, big hit, and they were ready to do their next big hit. And Mel, I believe, um, had a pay back pain and it was cancer. And she's like, they had a record at 20, 21, she was diagnosed, and 22, she was dead, and it's it's very yeah. touching and it really it shook them all up because they were all super close going to the pub every night after they recorded oh that's beautiful um number three blake number three um this will be a quick one i just want to tell you guys a little about a little show i'm watching it's on peacock and it's called the traders and it's hosted by alan cumming have you guys heard of this I have, I want to see it. Ruby, who's our executive at BBC Three, says that is the show in the UK right now. Oh, really? Yes. Well, it's kind of like Big Brother. In fact, a couple of Big Brother alums are some of the celebrities on it. So it's a total of about 20 people that live in this house. And one of them is murdered each night, you know. And the people that murder the, the other people are called the traitors of these 20 people there's like 10 regular people 10 celebrities you've got people from survivor bachelor below deck um big brother summer house ryan lochte <laughs> ah. brandy glanville ah. so it's really it's funny and the traitors pick someone to kill every night and then the house also votes to banish someone that they think is a traitor because if the traitor makes it down to the very end, then they'll win the the one traitor will win the big pot of money versus the 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 faithfuls is what the other ones are called. And they, they all win. work together to raise the pot of money. Is that correct? Right, right. It's a really cool, I think it may be you know, a foreign show that was remade into. Yes, this, it's it's, but... it's over here is the original and they did it like in a Scottish castle or something. This um, one's in a Scottish castle as well. So I would really suggest I'm only on, we've watched three episodes and I'm about to watch four. So it's really good. I love how it. many traders in each in the, in the cast. There's three traders of right. three of 20 people. And right. to decide who the traders are, they just sat them all at a big round table and put blindfolds on them. And Alan Cumming walked around the table several times and just tapped the three people on the back. So the audience knows who the traders are. Right. Ah, oh, right. So they only it's get... a hard one to explain, but it sounds it's supposed to be excellent and it sucks right. you in. And it's is it on the BBC, Tom, in the UK? I, I, I'm not sure. Hmm. Cause it, it's definitely this sort of breakout format. And it's like, when I was at the Asia TV festival in um, December, that, you know, everyone was talking about traders and it's like been 
formatted or sold to a bunch of countries. You know, sort of like going... RuPaul's Drag Race. A little bit, maybe. <laughs> it is on the BBC BBC One. Uh huh. Right. And Peacock right. here in the states. Right. So. All right, that's Traders on Peacock, or you know, if you get BBC using your Express VPN, you can do that. You can watch that version. Um, number two. Number two. I'm so proud of this title, Frozen. <laughs> One of my favorite Madonna songs, of course, but referencing this time the fact that the much anticipated movie about Madonna, directed by Madonna and written by Madonna, is indeed frozen. <laughs> it's not happening anytime soon. Uh, they've abandoned uh, development. Uh, the official excuse is because of her big celebration tour. Um, although reading between the lines of some of the articles about it, it seems like Frozen had run aground uh, <laughs> or had, had entered the state of suspended animation some months earlier um, because it seems like they had, first they had Di Di Diablo Cody was the first uh -huh. scriptwriter, and there was that fabulous Instagram live session with Madonna and Diablo trying to write the script, which is itself, that should be a play in the West End. Just that, yes. like, <laughs> it would be amazing. Um, and then um, she departed the project, and I forget the name of the second writer who came in. Um, Cressida is one of the names of that person. Like, maybe you can look it up. Um, she's an awarded uh, filmmaker. Um, and even uh, the two Havies from uh, Drag Race Espana were. Erin um, Cressida Wilson. Erin Cressida Wilson. What's she done? Secretary. Yeah. That movie, Secretary? I believe so, yeah. Which Maggie we'll Gyllenhaal, I think. Yes. yes, thank you. Where she's crawling around on all fours. So very, you know, and um, but uh, you know, apparently each, you know, every there were two versions, but they were each about 180 pages long, which is a little long for a movie. So then they were going to do it as a mini series, and that I think actually would be amazing. It should be a, like a four-parter. It's yeah. um, a mini series, and Madonna should have nothing to do with it other than licensing her music. Exactly, but we all know that that's not going to happen. Um, and not in a strong Garner, suit. She doesn't do movies. She, it's okay. We love yeah, you. You're fine. I know. Um, Jennifer Garner, right, won the won the role from a, from a very intensive boot camp that was organized. Um, that also had Florence Pugh. I mean, I don't think we've seen the end of the story. I'm really, I, I, you know, it's going to get made, just not anytime soon, unfortunately. Maybe like, um, was it Todd Solons who did the Carpenter story, but with Barbie dolls? Maybe yeah. it'll be Barbie. She'll just do it her at home. She'll just like right. act it out with Kens and Barbies and things. Right. And our kids. <laughs> we got to take one more break. House of Love is the exclusive drink of RuPaul's Drag Race just in time for your season 15 viewing parties. Four delicious cocktails, two mouthwatering mocktails, and viewing party packs are available as well. You just go to houseoflovecocktails.com and um, they'll be delivered to your door. And they are, though we say it ourselves, delicious. Mm -hmm. It's true. And a All sexy, right. great looking can. There, I said it. When we come back, we will reveal the number one thing that made us go wow this week. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. And welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with Tom and Blake. And I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm going to leave. I, I don't want to know what the number one thing this week that made us go wow is. I'm going to listen to the show as no, no. you're listening bigger to Bigger name it. on the other line. I know you, Fenton. You got a bigger name on the other line. Go ahead and take your Madonna, call. It's Madonna. Madonna's calling. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> number one. Um, so Paris Hilton is a new mom, Tom. Did you know this? I didn't, and none of us knew it because of this surrogacy thing. No one's putting their own child through their own vagina anymore. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> it says her and her husband, Carter Room, tied the knot late last year. And they began in vitro fertilization during the, in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. She says, we started going and doing it like a few months in because the world was shut down. We knew we wanted to start a family, and I was like, this is perfect timing. Usually, I'm on a plane 250 days out of the year, 
and let's just get all the eggs stocked and ready. And we have tons of them waiting. So she's a mom. She shared a picture on Instagram of the baby holding her hand and said, Do we know the baby's well, name or sex? We, we don't know the baby's name. He is a boy, but we don't know a name yet. We are being, being assigned, I guess we'll let him pick. And, um, and well, you know, and, and Paris looks incredible, is incredible, is 40. So I guess maybe surrogacy was the better thing. Although I think it's just have somebody else do the ugly part, right? No one wants stretch marks. <laughs> exactly. I guess it's the new thing to do. I mean, uh, Kim Kardashian, you know, has been doing it. Uh, Chloe just had a little baby boy not long ago via surrogate. That's true. So. It's true. Well, you know what? Uh, baby's a celebration in any family. So we wish the best to the Hiltons, to Paris and to her husband and to the, you know, I think of all the drama that, her aunts and mother cause <laughs> Beverly Hills housewives or here they call. I hope they can break that cycle. I hope yes. they can break that cycle. Yes. All right. Well, Fenton abandon us. Uh, Blake, thanks for staying on. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, James Blake. St. James will be back next week. It's never the same without him. And until the next time uh, before, uh, we'll be here, but until the next time go out and do something that makes the world go. Wow. wow. Bye.